Hey everyone, it's Sam, back again with a fresh new letter. Based on the response from the first two letters in this new batch, I'm feeling like things are going well for you guys. I know they're going well for me, at least, and for my family and friends who have been helping and listening to this little project. So, let's keep going. I don't know how many letters I'll be writing for this new group, but in any case, this is the next one. As usual, let's start off with the Q&A section, which you can feel free to skip if you're not interested. Do I have any stories that keep me up at night, or that left a deep mental and emotional scar on me? I'm guessing this person who has asked this has never listened to a lot of my previous letters. To give a quick answer, yes, and you can refer to my letters on Wendigo and Washuge to see why. The Wendigo experience was horrific, and the Washuge hunt was too but for a very different reason. I watched people die on both of those occasions. The troll experience that I talked about in the letter before this one was also quite disturbing, as was the hunt that I'll be telling you about in this letter. I have nightmares about these at least a few times a month, if not more. There are some others, but these are the ones that jump to mind immediately. Again, I'd point you to my Wendigo and Moshuge letters to understand this a little bit better. Is the Luska a species of Makara? No. Makara are far larger and almost exclusively inhabit the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Luskas are misunderstood cryptids. They are essentially very large octopuses that live in a select few parts of the Caribbean. They're not as big as a giant squid, but they're significantly larger than most other cephalopods. So, the Luska is much smaller than a Makara and lives in a different and much smaller region of the globe. I've never personally encountered a Luska, though, although Heather probably knew some people who have. She knew quite a lot about aquatic monsters. Are mermaids real? I knew someone would ask this eventually, and I'm surprised that I've only just now seen it. To put it simply, no, mermaids are not a thing. Ariel does not exist. But if it makes you feel any better, there are actually a few varieties of humanoid monsters that inhabit freshwater areas. I've talked about a few of these briefly in other letters, and this category includes species like the Nixies and the Yara, and most of them look quite human, like the elves of Lord of the Rings or, yes, even the Disney version of Mermaid. So, there are mermaid-like cryptids that live in lakes, streams, and very occasionally in bays or estuaries. But... When it comes down to the open sea and ocean, you won't find anything there. Are there humans with superpowers? Man, I wish. That would make being a hunter so much easier. I don't want to crush your dreams, but no, humans absolutely do not have superpowers. I feel silly saying that. However, there are creatures that look like humans that have certain supernatural capabilities. Vampires, fairies, and the aquatic species I named above all look like humans but can do some extraordinary things that we cannot. For example, many fairies can change their shape or produce light, but no flying or laser vision or anything like that. Sorry. It kind of surprised me that I had a few people ask about Dan's M4, the rifle that he used on the Chupacabra hunt in that letter. It seems like there's always some drama whenever I talk about guns. I guess it's because the topic is very important to some of you. So here are some thoughts. If you go back and listen to the letter, you'll see that the thoughts I expressed were not only about M4s, but also about assault rifles in general. I pick my words carefully, and Serena is a wonderful editor. There's nothing necessarily wrong with assault rifles, but the fact remains that if you're firing in anything higher than a semi-auto, which Dan was, these guns produce a lot of noise at once for a very long time, and they eat through bullets far faster and are generally harder for me to aim consistently than using a hunting rifle. I also find them more unwieldy in general. Note that like in the Chupacabra letter, I said, for me and most hunters, I've got nothing against assault rifles, but they're not my preference, and usually are not a great choice for most hunters. And after all, most of us are old school, I'd say. But if you find an N4 easy to aim, go for it. I'm just saying what works for me and most hunters I know personally, and how even small differences can literally be a life or death moment in this job. When it comes down to hunting monsters, I'm aware of the choices we make, so hopefully that clears things up. Do hunters get promoted to guides? Good question. 
and I haven't answered this one. There is an application process for becoming a guide, and I'm not terribly familiar with the ins and outs of it since I've never been through it. But anyone in the organization can apply. Guides do not rank above hunters, necessarily, so it's not exactly a promotion. But many guides, maybe even most of them, were formerly hunters, who decided to retire and switch to become guides. The person who asked about this also asked if I would be interested in becoming a guide. I consider it often. But now that I'm getting older, I'm thinking about retirement and moving on to something else. But being a guide is definitely a possibility. I kind of go back and forth on the idea. I guess we'll see in a few years, huh? Are there subspecies of certain cryptids? Yes, indeed. For many monsters, it's quite difficult to determine the exact nature of their subspecies, or if there even are any. Usually, they can be quite elusive, dangerous, or both. There are a few that we do formally classify as subspecies, though. Sasquatches are one of the best-known monsters in general, and one of the ones that we know have several definitive subspecies. I'll spare you the binomial Latin names, but to give one example, the Sasquatch subspecies of the southeastern United States is named the skunk ape, after the classic nickname. Thunderbirds also had three main subspecies, the main one being the Great Lakes Thunderbird. Bunyips seem to have at least two subspecies. So yes, there are many cryptids that have subspecies that we are aware of. How does secrecy work with the hunters? This is another good question, which I haven't answered super directly. This person asked if hunters are expected to sign some sort of non-disclosure agreement when they join the organization, or if they're free to talk about our work to anyone. There is no formal NDA, but there is a general expectation that we will keep who we are and what we do secret, or at least on the down low. But there are no formal rules regarding this, which may be a bit surprising. Nowadays, though, most people wouldn't believe you, even if you did out yourself or the organization. Hell, I know many, or maybe most of you guys here don't believe me. If hunters tell anyone about us or our work, it's usually our families and friends, and it hardly ever goes beyond that. My case is obviously different because I'm writing these letters, and as far as I know, this is the first time anyone from our organization has ever done something like this, I'm sure that a lot of people probably wouldn't like it. But as I said, there's no actual rule against it. I'm not even sure who else in the Hunters knows about these letters, besides the people I have told. From what I know, most people seem to be taking it well. Nobody seems to have put a hit out on me, at least that I know of. We'll see if anyone says anything about it later on down the line, though. All right, so those are the questions I'll be answering this time. As I've said many times before, I enjoyed this segment of the letters, since it lets me interact with you guys a little bit more. Serena suggested the idea that I could do a letter that's basically just one big Q&A, which I have found attractive. But I don't know how much you guys would like such a thing, so please let me know if you would be interested in the idea. Anyway, let's move on to the usual discussion about the monster I'll be talking about this time around. The Zabrak. First off, you need to know that the Zabrak is incredibly mysterious and relatively little is known about the species. The name Zabrak is Arabic and like the word Wendigo, the plural of Zabrak is the same as the singular. If there's more than one, you still just say Zabrak with no S's at the end. These cryptids seem to be extremely rare and even more extremely elusive because there are very, very few historical records of them, even by hunters. The earliest mention of a Zabrak we could even find come from medieval Persia, the region that is now the country of Iran. It was written by a man named Al Marzawi. The account has some inaccuracies and potentially fictional details. That's nothing new. It's also over 1,000 years old at this point, so some things about Zabrak may have changed since then. Al Marzawi also makes a few assumptions which sound ridiculous and disgusting, but which are reasonable. I'll get to that in a moment. Besides this, there are a grand total of six hunter records on the Zabrak, all of them before the 1900s. So before our encounter with one, Zabrak were not on anyone's radar in the modern day and might have been extinct for all we knew. Obviously, they are not. Zabrak 
are bizarre looking creatures, and most documentation on them struggles to describe them accurately. I'll be doing my best here, though. Zabrok look like a bunch of different creatures got thrown into a blender together. They are reptiles, but unlike almost any other surviving species, they have four legs that are long and almost resemble dog legs. Their bodies are lizard-like, with two humps on the back that aren't as big as camel humps, but they aren't as small as brown bear humps. The front hump of the Zabrok is larger than the back one, but neither is more than a foot tall or so. Zabrok have long, S-shaped necks with heads that almost resemble those of carnivorous dinosaurs, except the Zabrok have a pair of tusks, one on either side of the mouth, which are curved outwards and down. They remind me a little bit of elephant tusks, but just shorter in length. Zabrok tails are long, thick at the base, and thinner at the tip, and ending in a shape like a spoon or the end of a kayak paddle, long and curved slightly. These tails are very mobile and serve a strange purpose that I'll get to in just a second. The front feet of the Zabrok are like paws and end in sizable, curved claws that look like a black bear's. Their back feet have much shorter nails though. Zabrok can open their jaws very wide and much like snakes, their lower mandibles are made up of two separate halves, meaning that their bottom jaws can basically stretch out. The skin of a Zabrok is leathery but scaly, much like a lizard, and the one that we encountered was a muddy, yellowish color, almost like a dark shade of gold. Size-wise, the Zabrok we came across was eight feet tall at the top of its biggest hump, and when standing up, that's where its head was too. All Marzui's record that I mentioned earlier says that they're smaller than a cheetah, but unless the one we encounter was an absolute giant, that's not true whatsoever. Now, let's talk about lifestyle and the weirder and more dangerous aspects of a Zabrak. As far as we know, Zabrak live exclusively in Iran, although at least one account mentions them living in India, so perhaps at one time, they might have lived there as well. They favor dry environments like deserts and high mountains, and they're almost scarily mobile, able to leap and scramble over cliff sides and rock faces almost as well as a mountain goat or a lizard. It's quite terrifying to see something that big move over such difficult terrain so easily. Zabrak seem to be primarily carnivorous, and their size is usually more than enough to bring down the different hooved animals that form their main source of prey. However, Zabrak are not quite as fast as an antelope or a deer, so in an open chase, they would not normally be able to outrun these animals. So Zabrak either try to ambush their prey or use a unique and disturbing natural weapon. You see, there aren't many creatures that possess built-in ranged weaponry. Zabrak are one of the few exceptions to this. Now, the first part of what I'm going to say is just inaccurate speculation by a medieval author, and I've got to warn you that this next bit is going to sound incredibly disgusting and strange. I seriously can't sugarcoat this, even if it is ultimately false, and I promise you, I did not make this up, and you can look it up if you don't believe me. It's hilariously gross. So don't laugh when I say this, but all Marzoe claims falsely that Zabrak have acidic urine and feces. Yes, if this were true, it would mean that they basically pee and poop acid. And this would be absolutely nuts, I know. But as I said, that's false, as far as we know. However, weirdly enough, the actual truth is not very far off. It's extremely strange and disturbing. As far as hunters have discovered, Zabrak, uh, waste is not toxic, but their blood actually is. And even more bizarrely, it makes total sense why Al Marzawi and the medieval Persians might have thought the Zabrak urine was acidic. Zabrak have a specific opening under their bodies, near their back two legs, that they can eject blood from. The horned lizards of the southern United States can do a similar thing and spray their blood from their eyeballs at predators, 
which is awesome and crazy enough. I'm not making that up either, I promise. You can look that up too. But Horned Lizard blood is not acidic, and they don't have nearly as much of it as Zabrak. Zabrak have a special organ called a blood sac where they produce and store excess blood. Then, eject it out from there through the opening I just mentioned. You may be asking, why in the hell does this exist? Well, remember the shape of the Zabrak's tail that I was telling you about? Zabrak use the ends of their tails to catch the blood that they eject, and then they will throw their blood, which I've already said is acidic, at their predators or prey. And this is powerful acid, capable of melting through most skin and clothing in less than a minute. So, you have a predator that is easily twice the size of a lion, can run and climb, and is equipped not only with tusks and claws, but also the ability to just chuck acid at anything it wants to. It is a crazy example of evolution at work, and it's just as absurd and gross and messed up as it sounds. We don't entirely understand how Zabrak blood vessels and tails are able to simply not melt away, but it looks like at least their blood vessels might have a membrane or lining to them that protect the walls of their stomach. As for the tail, it seems to have a lining of some sort too, but that's not my area of expertise. So that's about all I know on that subject. So, all that wild and strange information is all the background you need to have on the Zabrak. Now, I want to make it clear that we did not know all of these definitive details before we encountered the Zabrak. None of the people involved had ever even heard of one before, and the sparse historical info that we had on us was not much at all. So we had to play things by ear somewhat and figured them out as we went along, slowly getting more info. So this is what happened when I had my only encounter with a Zabrak. As always, all the dialogue is just my best recreation of what people said. If you've listened to any of my previous letters, you should already know about Capital G Guides. Guides perform many different duties, but they're the people who help hunters find jobs. Guides are also usually the ones who deal with the rest of society when it comes to those jobs. For example, most guides are liaisons with local authorities to get hunters clearance to go and do certain things in certain areas. Then there's the cleanup crews. Some people call members of the cleanup crews undertakers with a capital U, but I don't think that's a formal name. There are a few other subgroups of the hunter organization, all of which with their own specialties and duties. They're all part of the hunters as an organization but they don't do the job of mainline hunters like me. One of these groups is called the Surgeons, with a capital S, and my older sister is one of these. She tells me that the name Surgeon comes from a long time ago, when these guys were the ones who took care of medical stuff for hunters, when doctors were not available. Nowadays, the jobs of surgeons have changed. Now that more easily accessible medical help is available at places like hospitals and clinics, it would be nice to have a surgeon on standby to treat hunters at all time, since that would save us from having to go to outside doctors and potentially compromise our secrecy. But unfortunately, it's just not possible to have surgeons available all the time, everywhere, that us active hunters might need them. So their duties have changed. In any case, my sister Erica is a capital S surgeon with a very specialized skill set. She was always very skilled at chemistry in school, and in fact, that's what she went to college for. She's never been the greatest tracker or marksman, but when it comes down to chemicals and compounds, she's like an encyclopedia. So, she decided to put this to good use by becoming a capital S surgeon instead of a mainline capital H hunter. Erica does a whole lot of different things in this job, but one of the main things that she's often called in for is toxicology. As the name suggests, Toxicology is the study of harmful substances, including different chemicals, poisons, venoms, and other toxins. There are a variety of cryptid species that possess venom or toxic substances, and Erica is frequently responsible for analyzing these things and conducting research on them. She's even helped develop some modern antidotes. I'm not too sure of all the exact details, but it's important and difficult work, as you might imagine. 
There's not many people that specialize in this field, and even fewer capital S surgeons that do. So Erica is almost always busy with this work. She's incredibly smart and talented, and it's not so uncommon for people from different states or even different countries to request her assistance in different matters. And that's exactly what happened a few years ago, which led to Erica and I encountering a Zabrak. It started when a Pakistani guide named Mustafa reached out to Erica on behalf of two hunters named Sadiq and Bushra. Apparently, these two hunters had been informed of a person who had been killed in a very strange manner and of a sighting of something very strange, and he wanted to call in some specialist help with the case. This had happened in a very rural area in Pakistan, and Erica thought that because of this, and because I might be able to help with any subsequent hunt or anything similar, it would be helpful if I came with her. I had accompanied her a few times before in these sort of trips, so I was more than willing to come with her on this one. It would turn out very differently than I think either of us really expected. Erica and I flew into Karachi, the biggest city in Pakistan, and the nearest airport to where we were going to be going ultimately. Karachi is on the coast, so it was quite humid and very hot on top of that, but we weren't staying there very long because our destination was to the west and the dry deserts there. When we got to the airport sometime in the very early morning, the hunter Sadiq was there to meet us. I've met a lot of people, but Sadiq is one of the coolest guys I know. Like, I wish I could be as cool as him. He's tall, skinny, with skin that's dark tan or olive, a, a little lighter than mine, but kind of close to Erica's. He usually has a bit of facial hair, but not super long, and he loves wearing sunglasses, or at least it's rare that he takes them off. He has that sort of laid-back air that shows off that he's confident, but that he's also not a jerk. He came up to us at the airport and shook both of our hands enthusiastically with a big smile. Welcome to Pakistan, Sadiq said when he first met us. Thanks for having us, I said half-joking. Sadiq patted me on the shoulder. Of course, of course. You must be hungry, no? He asked. We had eaten on the plane, so we turned down his repeated offers of food until he laughed and stopped asking. Everyone works better with some food in their stomach. Let me know when you need some. We have a long drive and I don't want you complaining. We did indeed have a long drive ahead of us to get all the way to our destination in the southwest of the country. Sadiq took us to a white jeep where we found a woman waiting for us. She was a bit shorter than me, so maybe around five and a half feet tall, with skin the same color of Sadiq's and wearing a blue hijab. She greeted Erica and I, only a little less enthusiasm than Sadiq, and cheerfully introduced herself as Bushra. I didn't get to know her very much, unlike Sadiq, but she was very nice and charming as well. Bushra and Sadiq both had Mustafa as their guide and would be the one showing us around and helping us on the case. Do you guys normally work together? Erica asked. No, I can't stand Sadiq. He stinks, Bushra joked. And Sadiq playfully sniffed under his arm. Hey, I actually took a bath this week, Sadiq responded, and we all laughed. We work together sometimes, but not always. It depends, Bushra answered. After the introductions had been made, Erica and I threw our stuff in the back of the jeep. We had a lot of supplies, so it was good that the jeep was roomy. As I think I've said before, most hunters, including myself, do not travel on public airlines, so we didn't really have to deal with the usual long lines at customs. Authorities do usually check our stuff, but in this case, Sadiq, Bushra, and Mustafa had talked to them beforehand and gotten us permission to proceed into the country. I had my usual assortment of weapons and camping gear. Erica didn't have any weapons except a knife, but she did have camping supplies, along with her most important cargo, a big box with many of her work materials and equipment. For fun, she calls it her mobile laboratory. It has all the stuff usual mad scientists have. Test tubes, microscopes, chromatography stuff, and so on. It's very fragile stuff, but like I said, we don't go on public airlines when we're on our jobs, so we are able to take good care of everything. We got on the road while it was still dark, and as we got out of the urban center of Karachi and onto the country highway, we were treated to a sunrise over the rocky landscape, which was a gorgeous sight. 
In my experience, some of the best sunrises are desert sunrises. Although we weren't quite in the heart of the desert when we saw this one, it was a nice way to start our time in Pakistan. Sadiq and Bushra are Muslims, as you might expect, and they stepped out of the car to say a quick prayer. But then we were back on the road right after that. With the sun now rising, my sister didn't waste any more time on getting down to business. Tell me everything, Erica said to our new companions after we had been on the road for a little while. Bushra did most of the explaining. She and Sadiq were two of the most prominent hunters in Pakistan and were involved in jobs all around the country. Their main areas of operation were the three big cities of Karachi, Islamabad, and Lahore. The area we were going to was one of these rural locations and had a big population of members of the ethnic group known as the Pashtuns. The Pashtuns live mainly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and many of them have homes in the countryside. A family in one such town had fallen victim to a very strange incident and had gotten in touch with Bushra through a mutual acquaintance. She had gone out to investigate the situation and had met with more questions than answers. What Bushra had been told was that a Pashtun man from the town who worked as a shepherd had gone out one day and never returned. Pashtun communities are very, very tight-knit, so word of this man's disappearance had spread incredibly fast. His family and friends obviously became concerned for his safety, and they began to search in the surrounding hills, going to the usual grazing areas where he usually took his flock. They'd found the man dead, along with multiple sheep, most of the rest of the flock was gone. All around had been strange footprints, along with several patches of what may or may not have been blood. However, not all the bodies were laying in actual pools of blood. As you might expect, only two of the sheep were found this way. They had very clearly been torn by claws or teeth, but the other sheep, along with the man, had very different wounds. Ones which looked like they had been inflicted by acid and had melted away their flesh. At least, that's what Bushra had guessed. She had taken extensive pictures and samples from the scene, which she had back in the jeep, but before we could get analyzing this material evidence, our first stop was to go to the place where the killings had occurred and check out the area for ourselves. I think the drive took about eight or nine hours, and we stayed on the main highway pretty much the entire time. Eventually, we arrived at the town, which was set near the side of some small hills. It was not big, so when we arrived, I felt conspicuous. As often happens, we stepped out of the car and were greeted by a flock of kids who came up to us. It seems they already knew Bushra and Sadiq, because they had immediately started talking to them in a language that I had guessed was Pashto, or maybe Urdu, staring at me and Erica while they spoke. We waved and smiled and Bushra and Sadiq seemed to be introducing us. After a moment, the kids came up to us, asking us some questions in English, mainly if we could repeat our names and say where we were from. We said our names again and explained that we were from the United States and that we were siblings. They seemed to understand this, and they seemed to be interested in us. I asked them to tell me their names, but... There were probably eight or nine of them, so although I pride myself on having a good memory, I couldn't remember all their names, which they found funny. After that, Bushra and Sadiq shoot off the kids, and we went further into town. We went to a red house with a flat roof where a younger man, maybe in his late 20s or early 30s, came out when we knocked on the door. Bushra and Sadiq greeted him in English this time, and he responds in the same language before introducing himself as Mahmoud, the younger brother of the man who had been killed. He invited us into the house, but we politely declined because we didn't want to waste any time getting to the bottom of things. Mahmoud's mother, an older woman, came out. She invited us inside, but we again turned down the offers. Hospitality and hosting guests are a big deal in many parts of the Middle East, South Asia, and the different stand countries and it's no different for the Pashtuns. I would have loved to come in if I hadn't been on a task, but of course, things don't always work out the way we want, so we just talked outside and listened to what Mahmoud told us. At the time, Mahmoud asked that we not tell anyone his brother's identity, so I won't say his name here. When I talked to Sadiq regarding this letter, he told me that Ahmed 
is a very popular Pakistani name, so that's what we'll call Mahmood's brother. The man who was killed. Mahmood explained what he had experienced regarding the death. Ahmed had gotten up early in the morning to take the family's sheep out to pasture, and Mahmood and the other members of the household had gone about their own days as usual. Ahmed usually returned before sunset with the flock, but on this day, he was still absent even after it was getting dark. There is some cell phone service in the area. It's pretty spotty, but it does happen. So Mahmood had called his brother, but gotten no response. This isn't unheard of, because the coverage can be spotty like I just mentioned, but it was still a bit odd. It was theoretically possible that Ahmed could have stayed overnight with the sheep because some of the grazing spots were some distance away, so Mahmud decided to wait until the following morning before deciding that anything was wrong. When the next day came around and there was still no news from Ahmed, Mahmud decided to begin his search. He started letting the residents of the town know that his brother was missing. Many communities in the Middle East and South Asia are tight-knit and supportive, so it's no surprise that almost everyone in the town knew Ahmed, or that many of them joined the effort to find him. It was a touching show of community and cooperation, but as you already know, it was met with a grim result. Mahmud had been informed by a group of the searchers that they had found Ahmed's body, and he had rushed over to the scene. We asked him to give all the detail he could remember, to get as much information as possible before heading out to the location ourselves. He had a lot of a description to give us, and he was able to express most of it in English, which helped me and Erica greatly. Ahmed's body had been found in a hilly area where he often took the family sheep to graze. The land had some patches of grass, but much of it was rocky and bordered by some cliffs and crags. Ahmed and the dead sheep had been near the base of one of these cliffs, and some of the rest of the surviving flock members had been found nearby. Most had been scattered, though. Around the area had been patches of dried, dark brown liquid that Mahmud thought was blood. However, as I said before, only two of the sheep had been mauled or torn to death. Ahmed and the others had wounds that looked as if their flesh had been melted. This was when Bushra showed me some of the pictures she had taken, which were incredibly disturbing. I got chills looking at them. The upper half of Ahmed's body looked almost as if it had been rotted. Parts of the skin were missing, and in some areas, much of the muscle was too. The bones were showing in several places, especially on his face, where much of the flesh was simply gone. The edges of all the wounds looked blackened, almost as if they had been burned or cauterized. It was sickening and extremely confusing. I had never seen anything like this, and I had no idea what could have caused it. It seemed like select key parts of the corpses had decomposed extremely rapidly, while the rest remained intact, but of course, this was not naturally possible. Certain parts of corpses would decay faster than others, yes, but this was not in any normal pattern or form, and of course, Ahmed had only been missing for a day and a half, far too short of a time frame for this level of decomposition to occur. It, it looked like someone or, or something had practically burned him and the sheep to death. The wounds looked almost like they had been made from a blowtorch or, as silly as it sounds, a laser. Or in any case, by something incredibly focused with a ton of penetrating power. Really strange and awful stuff. Mahmood naturally got a bit emotional as he talked to us and his mom sat by him and held his hand. Even she started to cry silently at one point. I've talked to a lot of people in situations like this over the years, but the sheer strangeness and all the unknowns of this situation really bothered me and made this one difficult to see. Eventually, we thanked them for their time and the information, then said our goodbyes and left. Now, it was time to go to the kill site. The day was hot, and seeing as it was the desert, it was also a very dry heat. We had prepared by putting on light, long-sleeved clothing and pants, and by putting sunblock on our exposed skin. We also wore sunglasses, and Erica and I had wide safari-style hats. Even so, it was still not a very pleasant climate, especially since by this time, the sun was around its peak. Thankfully, 
we were able to drive most of the way to our destination. There was no road out there, but Sadiq's Jeep was a tough enough off-road car that the terrain wasn't too bad. We got out a short way away from the site and walked the rest of the area. The way was exactly as Mahmood had described. Open, with yellow and brown dirt and sparse grass and a few trees, bordered to the west and the south by steep cliffs and rock faces. The ground had obviously been disturbed by many feet and hoofs, and I didn't know if we would be able to find many tracks, but we could try. Naturally, the bodies of Ahmed and the sheep had been taken away, but there still might be clues to find. We looked around, and soon found a few places where dry patches of the so-called blood were just barely visible on the ground. Things like this can stay around for a long time, especially in an arid environment like the one we were in. I got a closer view, but there wasn't much to go on. It just looked like faded brownish patches on the dirt and rocks. Thankfully, Bushra said that they had taken samples beforehand, and Erica planned to analyze them later. We continued to survey the area, and by some miracle, we came across a proverbial smoking gun, or so we thought. Near the base of the cliffside, there was a single footprint, which could easily have been missed, and was missed by Sadiq and Bushra the last time they were here. There also seemed to be part of a second print, but maybe not. Sadiq noticed the prints, and told us that he hadn't noticed them before, so we had gotten incredibly lucky this time. Look, right there, that's a footprint, Sadiq said, pointing to a spot in the dirt. Luckily for us, the area that he was indicating was in the shade, and judging by the angle of the sun, it would stay in the shade for almost all of the day. This meant that the earth there was a little less dry and was slightly more likely to receive and hold a footprint. And fortunately, it seemed that this very thing had occurred. The lone print was deep, clearly made by something quite heavy, but the shape was very unusual. Unlike most tracks I'd see a living creature make. However, it somewhat resembled a bird print and more than anything, I had seen similar footprints made by dinosaurs, of all things. This makes sense because birds are dinosaurs, but this print was huge. It wasn't quite T-Rex level, but I've seen ostrich tracks in person, and this footprint looked even bigger than those. This print had four toes, with three splayed out in the front, and one pointing more out to the side. To what I imagined was the inside edge of the foot. It looked like the toe ended in some sort of claw or talon. Judging from the slight drag marks and the deeper impressions at the end of each toe, it was baffling. I see it too, but I have no idea what kind of track it is, I replied. It looks almost reptilian, or maybe avian. I've never seen anything like it, Bushra said. Neither have I. There's nothing I know that would make this. At least, now we can be sure that humans weren't behind this, Sadiq said. Let's take some photos, at least. Do we have anything to make a cast? I suggested. I had to explain to Sadiq and Bushra what a cast was, because they didn't know the word in English, but they understood quickly. If you don't know what I'm talking about, making a cast is where you pour something usually like plaster or something like that into a footprint or a track to make a mold of it to keep. I think I've got something in the jeep. Let me go get it. Let's all keep our eyes up and see what information we can find, Sadiq said. We took pictures of the footprint. Sadiq did indeed have some plaster that we were able to use to make a cast of it. The casting process didn't take too long, as the plaster dried quickly, but beside that, there wasn't much else that we were able to get from the scene. There were some faint marks on one of the cliff sides, but they were unclear and may have been unimportant. On their first visit, Bushra and Sadiq had taken some samples of the dirt and rocks that had been splashed with that dried mystery liquid. However, we decided to head back to town so that Erica could examine those samples, while Sadiq, Bushra, and I talked with their guide Mustafa and did some research to try to find and determine the identity of our mystery killer and footprint maker. Of course, you are listening already so you know what we found out. We set up our camp outside of town. Despite being offered countless times by what seemed like the entire population to stay in their houses, it did get a little tiresome having to turn all those people down. But Sadiq and Bushra 
said that this was usual for them too. Erica set up a sterile area in her tent to do some analysis on the mystery substance, and Sadiq, Bushra, and I made a call to Mustafa after sending him photos of the footprint in the cast. He was just as stumbled as we were, and had no idea what this was, but he said he'd immediately start searching for any information. While we waited for him to get back to us, Sadiq and Bushra brought back a few capital H Hunter books and files from the Jeep for us to start looking through. These mainly consisted of the Hunter reports and records, which most of us in the organization often read to get helpful information. This time, however, we were looking for any mention of things that might match the evidence we've gotten. We hadn't been working very long when Erica came back with us with some preliminary results of her testing. She told us that the dried fluid was blood, yes, but not human blood. It had a strong acidic component to it, so much so that it had damaged the rocks and dirt that it had been on. In her estimation, when the blood was freshly spilled, it could have caused the wounds that we saw in Ahmed and the sheep. As strange as it sounded, the acidic blood had literally dissolved through the victims, melting the flesh and even parts of the bone. I thought about it, and at first I didn't want to believe it. It sounded almost too ridiculous, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that if it were true, it would explain a lot, especially how focused the wounds were. But the real question remained, what kind of monster could do this? We called Mustafa again and gave him the new information, which again baffled him as much as us. But he said that the new findings would obviously help narrow down the search, as he promised to get back to us with whatever he found. Pretty soon after this, Sadiq, Bushra, and I reached the end of the materials we had. Since it was almost one in the morning at this point, we just decided to call it a night and review the situation in the morning. We did exactly that. When we were discussing the case, we realized a glaringly obvious fact that had somehow been overlooked. None of the bodies had been eaten, so our mystery creature could not have been hunting for food, which in turn meant that it had likely lashed out in rage or in self-defense. Exactly how Ahmed had provoked it wasn't clear, but many animals are simply very territorial or temperamental. So we decided that we could be dealing with one such creature. Very early the next morning, Mustafa gave us a call and told us what he had found and what you already know. It seemed to be that we had a Zabrak on our hands. This is a very strange creature. There's next to no information on it just some very old reports and no photos or material evidence, Mustafa told us after he had briefly introduced the creature. So, you're saying that it has acid capabilities? I asked. Yes, but not like in the old stories. The most recent Zabrak appearance that I could find was in 1892. The monster was killed and dissected, and the autopsy found that it had a special sack in its body, filled with blood. It looks like this is what it was throwing at its prey and at hunters, Mustafa said. So, Erica was exactly right. Bismillah, I remember Sadiq whispering, which is a phrase that means, in the name of God. A bit of a short prayer. I'm not Muslim, but if I was, I probably would have said something similar. Because with our theory being confirmed, it would mean that this creature is extremely dangerous. We need to find this creature and bring it down. How can we track it? I asked. That will be hard. We could start by going back to the scene of the attack, Sadiq suggested. It would be easier just to try to bait it out and to attract it somehow, Bushra suggested. The records make it seem like Zabrak is very territorial. All attacks appear to be motivated by people encroaching on their home. If this one established a territory near the site where it killed the shepherd, you might be able to set an ambush there, Mustafa said. Well, it certainly attacked because it was being territorial. I didn't see any of its kills eaten, so it wasn't hunting for food, I said. We don't even know its feeding habits, Bushra noted, which was a good point. What did Zabrak even eat? No, and those are not clear, but in one instance, Hunter saw a Zabrak eating a chinkara, a type of gazelle. It must eat meat, at least sometimes, Mustafa pointed out. 
I know a guy who hunted these gazelles once. Maybe even someone in the town has. It might be possible to lure the Zabrak out with this kind of meat, Sadiq brought up. I think that sheep or goat would actually work just as well, I said. Wild animals are not usually picky. We talked a bit and formulated a plan. Instead of searching high and low for the Zabrak, we might as well be able to draw it to us. Getting meat for the bait would be easy enough, and although we didn't have any materials of the time to build any sort of elaborate trap, we did have steel cord to make basic snares. Hopefully, this would be enough to slow the Zabrak down just enough so we could finish it off. We did briefly talk about possibly sedating it and capturing the Zabrak, but quickly decided against it for a few reasons. First, we didn't really have a great way of transporting it anywhere, even if we did sedate it. And second, as friendly and welcoming as the townspeople were, they were also quite nosy, and who knew what they would do if they saw what we had captured. If we killed it, then we could keep it easily under wraps. Next, if we tranquilized the Zabrak, we had so little information on the creature that we wouldn't know where to relocate it to. Finally, with no real idea of the size or exact biology of the cryptid, it would be hard to determine the proper amount of tranquilizer for it. Too little tranquilizer and it would be sedated, and too much we would risk hurting it or killing it. And, if we were going to kill it in the first place, bullets were of course the better option. There were some trees scattered around the site where Ahmed and the sheep had been killed, but not enough to provide all of us with reliable cover. To give us a better chance of hiding, Sadiq had a hunting blind that was made in a desert camouflage style. It was big enough for two people. We would draw straws to determine that Sadiq and I would hide in the blind, while Bushra hid in the trees. We would position ourselves on opposite sides of the bait and stay put until the Zabrak got close. Then we would open fire and bring it down. Since we were talking about guns at the beginning of this letter, I should note that many hunters use sniper rifles for situations just like this one. However, most of us do not, because if things go wrong, it can be better to have something with a closer range and shorter range rifles provide this, while only slightly sacrificing sheer force and stopping power. The most concerning part was just how unknown the Zabrak was to us as a species. Without Erica, we probably wouldn't have been able to figure out that we were dealing with the Zabrak in the first place. The information we had on it was very sparse. Many hunter records prior to the invention of computers had been lost to us. It's not like anyone was really printing these, after all. In the case of the Zabrak, most of the material that Mustafa had found was incomplete and more focused on the biology and physical descriptions of the Zabrak's rather than its behavior. There wasn't much in depth detail, or much of any account, about how the play-by-play -play details of these hunts went, which is very different from how we do our write-ups today. This left us with a lot of uncertainty, and that was not a good thing, but nobody else was going to deal with the Zabrak, so we had to just buckle down and get to work. Securing a sheep was easy. Sadiq asked around town without revealing too much, and someone offered us a lamb. We didn't know what time of day that the Zabrak would attack, and we didn't know when the original attack had taken place either, but it was likely at sunset, or maybe a bit before then. This would be an ideal time to set our trap. Sadiq and I decided to set up the hunting blind at the base of the cliffs, while Bushra would be in the trees opposite to us, with the sheep in between. That would allow us to hit the Zabrak in a pincer formation. We headed out to the site a few hours before sunset, with the sheep, and wasted no time in setting things up. We tied the lamb to a pole that we drove into the ground, and then positioned ourselves as we agreed. There was little wind and the landscape was quiet except for birds calling off in the distance every so often. This meant that we had to be quiet as well to avoid being heard, so Sadiq and I were quiet as we laid in the hunting blind. It was hot, but since the sun was already getting low, we weren't roasting or anything. We had checked and double-checked the blind beforehand, partially covering it with dirt. We wanted to look well concealed, so I wasn't worried about being discovered per se especially as the light got dimmer. I was mostly concerned with the fact that, again, we just didn't have much information about what we were dealing with. The sun went down, 
and there was no sign of the Zabrak. I was ready for the very real possibility that it wouldn't show up at all, but I was still hoping that it would, so that we could settle this matter quickly. We had found no information about the Zabrak territorial habits, but this case made it seem like we were dealing with one that had a pretty large territory. But whatever size it was, we expected that the Zabrak would probably defend it, and that meant that sooner or later, it would appear. About an hour or so after the moon had come up, I heard a scraping sound from behind the blind and slightly above us. Both Sadiq and I turned and grabbed for our guns. The moonlight was low, so it was hard to make out exact details, but there was an unmistakable large shadow moving down the nearly vertical face of the cliffs, descending with frightening speed. Sadiq started praying, so quietly that even I could only just barely hear it. The shadow touched the ground and began speeding in our general direction, and now I could see it more clearly. I've already given you guys the description of the Zabrak, but now that I was seeing this thing firsthand, I was struck just by how strange it looked. Even its gait was very odd, and I can only describe it as something between a dog's and a lizard's, like it was scuttling and loping all at once. I realize how impossible this sounds or how hard it might be to visualize it, but it's genuinely very difficult to describe verbally. We watched the Zabrak hit the ground and drop onto a crouch, which only made it about five feet tall rather than eight. It whipped its head from side to side, and I got a good view of its tusks as it did so. The sheep started to bleat, and almost as soon as it did, the Zabrak lunged forwards and began to run at it. Sadiq and I raised our rifles, and then everything started to go sideways. The Zabrak slashed at the sheep with its tusks, knocking it to the side. But the monster did not stop there. Instead, it kept moving, heading straight for the trees where Bushra was. I felt my stomach drop, and I think Sadiq and I both realized in that moment the Zabrak had caught on to Bushra's presence. We both started shooting, and we heard Bushra do so as well. But, like many reptiles, Zabrak have tough skin. The cryptid entered the trees and gave a roaring screech. Bushra came racing out from her position, and Sadiq and I burst out from the hunting blind, I think out of instinct. I saw the Zabrak lower its tail between its hind legs, and that's what seemed like an instant later. I saw the Zabrak lower its tail between its hind legs, and then, what seemed like an instant later, it whipped its tail forward over its back. A huge amount of the Zabrak's dark blood flew and splashed Bushra squarely on her backside, and she collapsed. I heard a lot of people screaming over my time as a hunter, but this was one of the most gut-wrenching times it's happened. Bushra was howling in pain, thrashing on the ground like she was on fire, and Sadiq and I were much too far away to have helped her. The Zabrak came bursting out of the trees and ran towards Bushra. Sadiq and I opened fire and the Zabrak began to twist and weave around, avoiding many of our shots. It started to bring its tail down again, and this time I think I, I knew what was happening. I flung myself to the side. I felt searing hot drops of blood patter down onto my lower calf. I immediately rolled my leg into the dirt as best as I could to try to get this acidic fluid off. It seemed to maybe work just a bit, but a wave of burning pain still ran through my leg. The Zabrak flung its tail out again, and this time at Sadiq, and I saw him writhe around onto the ground as well. I couldn't tell if he had been hit or not. All of this happened so fast. Even retelling it may be wrong, but this is the best I can remember. My eyes weren't on Sadiq as much as they were on the Zabrak, though, and when I saw it begin to lower itself again, I started shooting. The Zabrak flinched as I shot it, and seemed visibly shaken but that didn't stop it from starting to rush me. I hadn't brought any close-range weapons except for my knife, and if the monster closed in on me, I doubted that I'd have a chance against it. But if I ran, I didn't have anywhere to go, and the Zabrak was unquestionably faster than I was. As usual, none of these calculations consciously ran through my head, and so it was mostly gut instinct that drove me to hold my ground. Maybe, if I could land one good shot, I could bring down the Zabrak before it hit me. I got up to one knee and started firing. The Zabrak's charge was straight on, and its head was lowered, meaning that I was able to put a bullet through the back of its neck and into its first hump, 
when it was about 30 feet away, much too close for comfort. It screamed in pain and staggered to the side, exposing itself. At the same time, though, it lashed out with its tail, which it must have been stalking with blood as it ran. I later realized that I must have gotten incredibly lucky and interrupted this process because the amount of blood that the Zob rock threw this time was significantly less than before. Only a few drops splattered across my rifle and my gloves, but I did not stop firing. I saw the Zob rock reel as I hit it repeatedly, and then I heard Sadiq's gun come to life as well. Each shot loud as hell in the desert night. The Zob rock collapsed and twitched feebly with a sputtering cry, and I let Sadiq finish it off while I dropped my gun and tore off my gloves, hissing in pain as the cryptid's blood sizzled away at the material in the outer layer of my skin. Not sure exactly what to do, I started scrubbing my hands frantically in the dirt, and eventually, the intensity of the pain lowered. The level of pain went from fiery hot to just lukewarm, you might say. The pain in my leg had also died down, and I had to imagine that I had gotten most of the acid off of me before it had done too much damage. After addressing my hands, I immediately went back to check on Sadiq and Bushra, and it was not a scene I'd ever want to see again. Bushra was on the ground unmoving, and I caught the briefest glimpse of where the Zabrok's blood had splashed her torso and head. I honestly don't even want to describe it, but you can use your imagination. The sight made my stomach churn, and I felt myself almost recoil away from her body. Sadiq was on his hands and knees next to Bushra, choking out what I assume were prayers and clearly trying to keep himself from sobbing. It's always hard to see anything like this. It sucks to see anyone wind up like this. Of course, hunters know that this can happen to them at any time when they take on a job, but that doesn't change the impact such deaths can have. Often, there's not much to say for grieving people to help them, especially right in that moment. But I sat down next to Sadiq anyway, being careful to avoid the Zabrak blood that was still hissing quietly on the ground. I put a hand on his shoulder and said, I'm sorry. He gripped my hand with one of his, and I held it longer than maybe I should have, until he stopped speaking and let go. His breathing seemed to return to a gentler rate. After sitting with Sadiq for a moment or so, I got up and called Erica, telling her to get in touch with Mustafa and get a cleanup crew right away, and giving her the sad news about Bushra. I won't go into all the details of the wrap-up of this job. The cleanup crew arrived and took care of Bushra, but they asked me to stay around to help them do some analysis on the Zabrak. Erica came there as well, and we gave Mustafa and the cleanup crew all the information we could. There were some measurements taken on the spot, along with hundreds of photos of the scene, and even though he was devastated by Bushra's death, Mustafa congratulated us on taking care of the situation. He also stressed the importance of what we had done, we had brought down a monster thought to be extinct, and we could get incredibly valuable information from it. Of course, it was incredibly sad and frustrating that we had to kill the Zabrak, because we had no idea how many more were out there. For all we knew, this could have been the last one. As it turns out, though, that was not the last of the Zabrak. I'm not going to give you exact numbers, partially because there isn't an exact count, but since this hunt... Hunters have discovered that more Zabrak are alive and well, mostly in Pakistan. They are incredibly rare, though, and their species are considered critically endangered. To use the technical techno to use the technical terminology, like other cryptids, Zabrak are strange and beautiful and terrifying all at once. And there is a lot more work that needs to be done to understand them. Much of that research is going on as we speak with capital H hunters like me and capital S surgeons like Erica working in tandem, Sadiq and Bushra became the best known hunters in Pakistan, and I and everyone I know appreciate Bushra's sacrifice and her condition to the hunters as a whole. Sadiq, by the way, has been doing very well since then. He's still hunting, and he's still just as cool. So, there you have it. That was my one and only encounter with an extremely rare monster maybe the strangest cryptid I've ever dealt with in my life. If you've gotten this far, thank you as always. But before you go, I've got a quick question about future letters. 
I may do one specifically focused on interactions between cryptids, so tell me if that would interest you. But otherwise, we're getting to the point where soon we'll have covered all the different cryptid species that I've personally dealt with. There's only a few more. So, in addition to wanting to hear your questions and feedback, I also want to ask you about future letters. Would you guys like to hear more of my own experiences with monster species that we've already covered? For example, I could do another letter talking about other times that I've dealt with Sasquatches. Or would you like me to reach out to other hunters and tell you some of their stories about different types of creatures? That way, each letter would still be about a different species. Let me know which of those choices you would like, and we'll see what happens. And again, you can also let me know if you would be interested in a letter that's entirely Q&A focused, and one that's focused on interactions between monster species or both. Anyway, I think maybe we'll talk about vampires next. That's a bit of a longer case though, so unless I do a lot of summarizing, I may have to split it up into two letters. We'll see. But as always, thanks for letting me share my experiences. Please let me know your thoughts on my questions and ask any questions of your own. I always appreciate your communication. We'll talk more soon. This has been Sam White Owl, signing out.